So no chat GPT. No. <laughs> Just throwing that in there for the young people out there who think this is how we write things. No chat GPT. We're talking about grapes this week. At least that's what uh, Isaiah talks about in this Sunday's lectionary text. And look, there's a new face on this show, not new to much of the life of Riverside for the past season, but the Reverend Dr. Lisa Weaver. Great to have you joining us for the Word Made Fresh. How are you doing this? Is it morning? This afternoon? This afternoon. Thank you, Reverend Keaton. I am doing well. It is good to be here. So your role, let's just, before we get into your text, you have been helping with Riverside in the areas of worship with some of our programming. Talk a bit about just, you know, what, what is it you bring? I have an insight because I know you used to like teach this worship stuff. What are you doing at Riverside and what's kind of the uh, long tail you carry with you that is your PhD and expertise in all of this stuff? Um, so my, primary, my major role is supporting all of the activities of worship, anything that happens in the nave. Um, in terms of training, I went to Catholic University, and so my PhD, my formal training, is in liturgical studies and sacramental theology. Uh, but I have been doing worship things long before my doctoral program. Amazing, amazing. And you bring all of that to all of the wonderful things we're doing at Riverside. And this coming Sunday is your second sermon, I believe, at Riverside? Yes. I preached the closing sabbath series at the end of summer i think i preached on labor day I think yes so. I think it was so. labor day. day all right well adrian you get the sunday off how does that feel for you <laughs> oh my gosh i'm so looking forward to it not that i don't love preaching and being in the sanctuary at riverside church but i'm actually going to be away on a retreat with other clergy and i've been looking forward to that for months so really grateful to have dr weaver in the pulpit and all of the worship team supporting what goes on that sunday it's going to be good it's going to be good okay great. well that's sunday uh we are in the book of isaiah chapter five so uh, I think when I was looking, this is our first time dipping into the Southern Kingdom because we just had Hosea last week, who was actually a contemporary of Isaiah. They're in the same general time frame. Although, Bible geek note, Isaiah is actually three Isaiahs, uh, first, second, third Isaiah, spanning a long period of time. Dr. Weaver will teach us a class on that later, I'm sure. This Isaiah chapter 5 is right at the beginning. Uh, Lisa, what's going on in Isaiah 5? What's happening in this text that you're going to be preaching? Um... It's, it's a, it feels like a weighty text. Um, and I'm, thank you for mentioning first, second, and third Isaiah, because if we look at Isaiah and Israel's history within the Isaiah text, that text deals with pre-exile, exile, and post-exile. And so there's a way in which God tries to warn, um, like, hey, um, I gave you these rules. They're not onerous. I really need you to follow them. And the people are like, eh, you know, they, you know, they, they can be whimsical and not necessarily as compliant, perhaps, as God would like. And they end up in exile as a consequence. But the overarching theme, I think, biblically and with this text and with the complementary uh, text for the day is that God loves them. Hmm. Right. That consequence does not obliterate God, um, that that disobedience does not obliterate God's love, but there, there's a consequence for behavior. And that the, the thing that stands out is God said, I did everything for you. I made all of the conditions right for you to do what I wanted, what I asked. I made it so that it wouldn't be onerous. And still, you know, I did everything to get like these really good grapes and I got these rotten grapes. Yep. Right. So God's like, I can't make wine with that. So, you know, so it's, it's hard. It's a hard text to hear. And the, the question that came to me and I was talking to Reverend Adrian about it is what does it mean when God's people disappoint God? And I'm thinking that parents have a particular kind of understanding of this text, you know, when you have expectations for your child and you've done everything for them and, you know, they kind of, you know, do their own thing. I mean, it's interesting because last week with Hosea was this whole, was very much a parenting metaphor of, you know, 
the toddler who won't go down for their nap. And now it's this rotten grapes metaphor. So you definitely got a whole lot of similar vibes going on on the north and the south. And the prophets have a very similar message for God's people, it seems. Right, right. And, and the tension, it's Isaiah 5 and it's Isaiah 11. So the question becomes when you get these split, split texts, which one do I lean into? But there's a complementarity, I think, with the text because God's like, you've given me these rotten grapes and I had good soil and great water. And then in 11 and the gospel text is like, but there's this judge that doesn't judge according to what he sees, right? There's this judge that comes with righteousness, right? So it's this contrast between God's like, I'm pulling back the hedge, because God is like, I'm going to take away the protection. I'm going to pull down the walls. There are four things. God says four things that God's going to do because Israel's not obedient. And yet there is God's love. There is God's mercy that God, God is planning for the redemption of God's people, even before the people disobey. Even in the midst of it, God is planning. Like so great is God's love. That God's like, all right, you know, I get this image sometimes of God's like, oh, you know, here we go. I got I to gotta make a plan. It's so uh, interesting. I just came out of Bible study with the Tower League, our um, older adults, uh, just kicking around some of these texts in this season and into Advent. And someone used that very same metaphor. They said, I just think God sits around with God's <laughs> head and God's hands going. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> it's yeah. such a powerful, um, yeah, disappointing uh, image right. that we just can't quite seem to get it right. Right. Yeah. It's something, Reverend Thorne, that you say often in many different ways is that there is nothing we can do to make God unlove us. Right. To right? make God love us more or make God love us less. Now, yeah. that is not a license to sin. I'm getting to the New Testament now. Heaven forbid. I think it's one of the little books in the back, right? Let us not take the grace of God and make it a license to sin, but that w there's nothing we can do to make God love us more or less. But the, the, I think what I like about the text is it, it brings to the fore something that in my limited experience, people don't grasp hold that because we love God and because we claim God and we know that God loves us, that does not exempt us from consequence. Right. We hold intention, consequence and love. You know, what's happening to me? God's supposed to love me. Well, but you can't run around with with impunity. Right. I mean, we can't function with that. And we've seen enough of that in the news. The people who think that their status, their zip code, their fill in the blank should exempt them from consequence. And the biblical text says no. But but disobedience and consequence still does not eradicate God's love. So what are you going to do with that? Because, you know, given that we are in a progressive church, I think that can be a thing that progressives lean mm. into. Oh, but God loves me. Oh, but God is gracious. It's like, yeah, but there's going to be some consequences. <laughs> we don't do we consequences. Here, yeah, right. we don't do consequences well, uh, you know, unlike you know, some of our other siblings in the, in the faith. Right. right. I, yep. I don't know. I, I know one of the things that occurs to me is that sometimes, and I don't think this is limited to progressives, just humans, we're good at, oh, they should experience consequence, but not me. They should, because I am, you know, I am the Reverend Dr. So-and-so. I am Bishop so-and-so. I am Congressman or, you know, Chief blah, 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 right? I mean, there's so many things in the human condition that we think we need to be exempt from consequence. And I'm not trying to lean hard. I mean, you know, I tend, oftentimes when I have to preach, God tends to give me a pretty rough word. Um, so <laughs> as um, one of my favorite preachers says, she says, I'm not the happy preacher. So I don't tend to be the happy preacher, but want to feel good. Don't come to Reverend Weaver's sermon on Sundays. <laughs> not come. She's she is not going to disturb, gonna... disturb the comfortable, right? That's right. Uh, this will be some disturbing the comfortable. Right. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, there's the prophetic and then there's the peace that comes, right? Reverend Thorne, you talk about God's lavish love. I mean, I think that's part of the subtext of this, right? It is this lavish 
love. Because God's like, I'm tearing down all the hedges. He's, no, I'm going to send somebody. I'm going to redeem them. Give us, give us a glimpse at your process. This text is obviously rich. Uh, Isaiah's got a lot. How do you even go about creating this thing called a sermon? How does it come to, you know, where we are now? And then in, you know, a little bit of time, you're going to preach the thing from the pulpit. What's your way of forming that preaching moment from here to there? The, fir- the very first thing that I always do when I'm asked to preach, given the assignment to preach, my prayer is a question. And it's like, God, what do you have to say to the people in that place that day? That's the first thing, right? The second thing I do is, um, it's, it's, it's a nerdy seminary practice. Uh, I print the text and, I'm, and I just sit and mark the text. I mean, full disclosure, I was also an English teacher, so I do this word thing. So you said you want to see what it looks like? This is what it looks like, right? Like you've got lines and, you know, what repeats, what words stand out, what, um, what sequences are there? Because, again, God says in verse 5, and now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. And there are four things. Right. I mean, we tend to just kind of read. But when we parse that, you know, for God to come and say, I've got four things I'm going to do that's not comfortable. That's a lot because, you know, most times, you know, if you you punish your child, you say, I'm going to take away your phone for a week. One thing. God says four. God's pretty angry. Right. And so and what words repeat? Like there's an expectation at the beginning and there's an expectation at the end of the text. So in what ways are there themes or words that are envelopes, you know, old seminary word inclusios, right? These things, how is the text bracketed? You must remember that, Reverend Jim, you're laughing. You remember Hebrew Bible and your inclusios, right? So so I kind of, did, I just draw on the text. I just sit and just draw, just what comes up? What are the patterns? Then I'll read some commentaries. Um, perhaps maybe do some word studies if something really jumps out. Then I'm like, okay, God, what what's what's coming up? And so, and then and then the outline begins to take shape. Um, I generally don't have an outline before I do this. Wow. Mm-hmm. So no chat GPT. No, I'm just, <laughs> just throwing that in there for the young people out there who think this is how we write things. No chat GPT. No chat GPT. No AI. No, no AI. It's not intelligent. No. People can tell. Right. They not write that. <laughs> right. And, you know, you know, and you don't want to go out and say, oh, they plagiarized that sermon, you know, and next thing you know, Reverend Weaver now works in X. <laughs> You know, I mean, we want to have integrity with the process. So no, no GPT, no AI, you know, footnotes, you know, citations. So yeah, but it's a hard text. Well, and I love that process. I love even the visual of seeing it. You know, I I, I mean, I I love the way it it brings, you know, a, a very, what, you know, linear thinking, but with an artistry at the same time, because of the way that you're physically connecting with the text on the page. And even the fact that you do all that, and then you move to the commentaries and then you move to the outline. It's this like foundation of what you've noticed that lets you build upon that for the particular context that you'll be stepping into to preach. And oh, it's just take note, everyone watching that. That's how you write a sermon right there. And I would add to the, uh, the conversation with God. OK, God, what what do these people need on this day for this time? Um, and then the listening for what will come, because all of that foundational stuff um, You've got to then say, and so what? What are you giving me to say? Yeah, exactly. that, this is not just yeah. a new chapter in the commentary you're writing. This is a sermon for a people in a place at a particular time. Yeah, it's not an essay. It's not. It's not because, and you both know, you can have a text, and there can be three sermons in it. Like, oh, oh at least I can go at this least. way, I can go that. Like, there's a lot happening, but it's like, God, what do you want to say? Right, like the one you, you preach at Riverside would not be the one you'd pe- preach at Trinity. Correct. Or, you know, yep. yeah. Correct. Yep. correct. And even, you know, you get assigned or happen to preach the same text, right? The, the research is done. Your process is done. And I don't even take this for granted if I preach it again. I'll revisit it. 
you know, I may highlight it. Something different may stand out. So, but to your point about the commentaries in seminary, we, our Hebrew Bible professor, we were allowed to use commentaries. I got to New Testament and he was like, no commentaries for the whole semester. And we went, <gasps> he said, he, he taught us this. He said, you, he said, what you produce is commentary. You, he said, I want you to write the commentary. What comes to this for you? And so it's like, oh, so even though it was frightening at the beginning, it's like, oh, okay. So then at the end of the semester, we look at our papers and we go to the commentary. We were like, oh, they missed that. You know, I had this insight, right? You can, it kind of bolsters your confidence. Like, oh, a commentary is just someone thinking very deeply about it. And part of our training part of his training of us was to think deeply about it, that you can do what these people on your bookshelf do. So it's an exercise. So I don't go to, I, he's trained us not to go to commentaries first. That's good. That's, That's wise. Great. Yeah. Well, we could, we, this is dangerous with the three of us on a call together because we could both talk about a sermon you're preaching, not to mention the art of preaching for far too long. So uh, I'm just going to make a note that we need to get the three of us on camera more often because I think this is fun. Maybe you watching thinks this is fun. Do you think this is fun? If not, thanks for sticking with us. If so, yes. So all of you watching, listening, uh, this coming Sunday is going to be, as always, incredible. The Reverend Dr. Lisa Weaver will be bringing all of that foundation and questions and prayers to our particular context at Riverside. And if you have thoughts, ideas for this, uh, th these texts here from Isaiah, rotten grapes, all this good stuff, you know what to do. Drop a comment, drop a question. We want to hear from you as this conversation continues and we all get ourselves ready for another Sunday. Join us in the nave if you're in the area. Join us online if you're not in the area. 11 a.m. worship begins. And as always, we hope to see you and we'll talk with you again on the next one. Take care, everyone.